Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for shaking off last night and making it out this morning. Um, I really liked that last slide that we were looking at uh, in the last presentation, particularly because I was thinking about when we were starting, when we were going to do this talk, um, starting back, like, let's say, 30 years ago when the internet was created, right? This idea that it's this realm of possibility. Anyone can sort of build whatever they want. They can sort of go wherever they want. Uh, it's, it's huge in, in potential, right? And then fast forward to 2019, and we get the slide that we just saw a minute ago, which is, is four or five big American companies represent a lot of the web traffic that exists today. Google, Google represents some 50% 50, 50 of all views on the internet or something like that. And so all the power has essentially consolidated into a number of big companies, right? And uh, it seems like we, we came, we've come to a very different place than where we kind of started or what the potential of the internet had uh, uh, to begin with. So I, I think it's perfect to have you here uh, as one of the co-founders of Ethereum. I just, I kind of want to talk about what it meant for, for you when you started uh, working on Ethereum and how you guys kind of thought about it and, and in, in relation to how people use uh, the internet today. Well, yeah. Um, I mean, the two, th the two threads are related for sure. Sure. Um, when, I, when I began Ethereum, uh, it, was, it was not long after the Snowden, um, the Snowden revelations. Sure. And there was already this uh, you know, sort of general feeling that uh, the, the internet was becoming increasingly, uh, an increasingly difficult place to um, you know, to, to to say what you wanted, to publish what you wanted, to um, to call call out the big um, the big problems in society, sure. right? Um, and we had this from the sort of Assange things as well, right? That was that was a big deal, and it's continuing to be a big deal. <laughs> um, and one of the one of the aspects that I felt Ethereum um, could contribute to was the alteration, the balance of power of this um, sort of. I mean, the, if you look at the internet, what is it? It's a way of communicating. Sure, in many respects, it's a publication platform. It allows people to get their word out there for whatever it is that they want to tell people, other people about. That's kind of one of the one of the key things. And a lot of it is nonsense, rubbish. You know, what what did I have for dinner yesterday? But, but that's the of, point of the internet, right? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I don't know what uh, yeah what they. Made it for originally, but um, <laughs> perhaps perhaps that's what they considered it. Like, yeah, let, let's let's make a platform so people can post the pictures of their the, their pub visit last night. <laughs> Maybe that's exactly what Tim Berners Lee was thinking. Um, but nonetheless, you know, I wanted to. Uh, I, I I saw early on in 2014 that you know um, Ethereum could well play a, a role in this sort of next way of doing things on the internet. You know, sort of making the internet great again. Mm. And so we get to you know, the sort of crux point, I would say, probably with you know, the rise of Bitcoin, the rise of Ethereum, the rise of, of blockchain, and the idea that perhaps, and you tell me, but perhaps there's a better or different way of making the internet work for people in the future. And that, and that is you know, the sort of potential of, of what blockchain represents. Now, I think we're in this point, or at least over the past few years, for a lot of folks, the blockchain basically meant cryptocurrency, right? I think, I think as soon as you hear blockchain, or for a lot of people, you kind of think, okay, does that mean Bitcoin or something? But I don't, think, I don't think that's necessarily completely true, and that's kind of what your project right now uh, with Parity is, is, is kind of about. I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about Parity and, and Substrate and Polkadot and explain to people what you're, what you're working on right now. Well, at Parity, most of our, um, most of our mind space goes towards uh, rethinking um, the fundamental architectures of the internet. So um, most of this comes down to decentralization, right? Mm. If, if you put it down to a word, it, it's really that. Um, and one of the things that you, if you look throughout human history, one of the things you find is a fairly common theme is middlemen, right? Uh, so there's consolidation, centralization, and centralization generally brings in middlemen, right? Mm. So it's this idea that if I want to do, if I, if I want to interact with you, right, then unless you're my friend, unless you're part of my family or my friendship group, then I have to go find someone else that kind of knows both of us, at least that we both trust. Sure. Yeah? And 
if it's if that if that third person party is a friend, then great. If you're a friend of a friend, then it, it, it's all good. Um, but if they're not, if I have to go to to have to find someone else, you know, as a service, as a general public service, then it becomes costly, right? Mm. And it often becomes slow as well. And there are all sorts of things associated, like maybe they're not trustworthy. Maybe they're going to introduce me to some scammer, right? Maybe I I, I don't know. So. What, what all this technology that we're developing, you know, ultimately Substrate, Polkadot, everything that we do at Parity is about really is, is trying to get rid of the need for these middlemen, the need for these, well, you know, another way of calling them is authorities, trusted third parties. There's all sorts of ways of naming these guys, but they're basically the people that are, don't really need to be part of the transaction because I just want to transact with you. I don't, wanna, I don't care about them. I just want to transact with you. Yeah? When, when you say that, do you mean like, a Facebook or an eBay right. or a whatever. If I talk to my friend, yeah. right, I, the transaction, the communication is from me to them. But yet Facebook is in between us, right. Right? right? I have to go to the Facebook platform. All my messages go through their servers. Right. And this results in Facebook collecting a huge amount of data right. that they have to themselves, that they can analyze, and all the rest of it. And, and that's where a lot of these problems in society that we are, that we are slowly discovering are coming from. And do you, so. The value, so I would push back and say the value proposition of a Facebook or, um, or a Google or an eBay or whatever, like these, they essentially aggregate uh, that attention or that, the, the ability to make connections. Like you could argue that it would have been very difficult for me to find and connect with a lot of the people that I was able to do that uh, on Facebook right. without them there. And, and so I guess I'm wondering, it, you know, do normal people find that more valuable than the idea that they can can take that back, you know? Or are they willing to, to, get, to trade whatever that is? If that's privacy, if that's uh, just sticking ads that, uh, next to content that may not be real or may not, may not be, be, be uh, verifiably true or whatever. Mm -hmm. Do you think like normal people are willing to make that trade off? Or have we hit a point where, you know, the middlemen are starting to become actually vulnerable? Um, I, I think I don't think there's a trade-off to be made. Mm. You know, um, so eBay fulfills two. To take an example, fulfills two key roles. Right. Firstly, they match make. So they find they match buyers with sellers. Sure. Yeah. I want to buy I don't know whatever a mirror on eBay. It'll find me with someone with a mirror and, and and let me know who they are. Secondly, it's trust. Right. So secondly, they set up the deal, they decide who pays what, they decide when they pay, they decide what the, the caveats are, the mirror must arrive, it must be in good condition, all the rest of it. Yep. Um, those two things, they're, they're both important, but they don't both need to be done by the same person, the same company, or the same service. Mm. They can be split apart. Now, it's not in eBay's interest to split them apart, because if they split them apart, then the bit, all of that second bit, all of that trust bit, they can't chart, they can't sort of amalgamate that cost right. with the matchmaking bit. Actually, matchmaking is a, is a very good service. We still want matchmakers, regardless of what happens with blockchain and cryptocurrency and all that stuff. We still want matchmakers. Matchmaking is a, is a legitimate service. The, the, the service that we can solve by technology isn't matchmaking, or at least maybe we can help with technology, but it's a different thing to the thing that we've already really pretty much got solved, which is trust, mm -hmm. right? So blockchain consensus systems really are the things that are solving trust. And if that's the expensive bit, right? That's the bit that's got the high margins. That's the bit that you can basically sit as a cash cow in the middle of the market and no one can touch you because of this network effects, right? Trust is all about network effects. If a million people already trust you, then another person is going to go with, with you, right? It, it, it stands to reason. Do you, do you see a different value on, well, let's, first let's talk about, you have this premise of Web 3.0, right? This is something that you've, you've talked something about uh, and the idea that individual privacy is actually more important to people at this point. Do you see, what, what do you see as the inflection point for that over time? Or is that, has that sort of changed? Is it basically you know, um, this fraught moment in history that we're in? Or is that just if things been sort of leading that direction for a while? Yeah, this, I, 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 I'm afraid I'm not much of an optimist on this point. <laughs> I'm not sure how much people but, really care about privacy, at least not yet. I think it might right take... Right now. Right. I, I, think, I think people are waking up to to what they're losing, yeah. um, but you know precisely whether it, it becomes a key factor in in their choice of platform, <clears throat> in some sense the choice of friendship set. I don't know. Um, 
I, I think certainly there's five or ten percent of the population that care. Mm. Um, but whether they can make the other eighty or ninety percent care is 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 an interesting question that I think is going to play out over the course of the next decade. Do you, do you think that those are the folks that are spurring this development in blockchain? I guess the thing I'm trying to figure out is like what is what's going to get it going, right? You know, we 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 have uh, some early we saw in that last presentation these early sort of projects that are kind of taking, you know, going off in a lot of different directions. But what, is, what do you see as spurring more development in that area? Um, I, yeah, I think, I think the, uh, the industry as a whole in, in terms of, for blockchain is really, you know, um, at the moment there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of true believers, a lot of idealists. Sure. Um, maybe some people who are, uh, who are actually legitimately trying to solve problems in, in industry, like real problems. Some people who kind of see this as being a, an important platform for bringing together people for new, like C to C, right? It's a new kind of industry, consumer to consumer sure. sort of products. Um, but yeah, there's, there's definitely still a large contingent of, of idealists and they will indeed care. Uh, they'll be the ones to really care about this privacy. But critically, the, the technology as a whole um, if there is some reason, it doesn't necessarily have to be privacy that people adopt the technology for, but the technology will likely uh, make privacy possible. Because at the moment, mm. using the standard internet sort of B2C architectures that we are, the, the sort of Facebooks and the Ebays and the Google, that's, that will not, that's simply not an, um, there, is no, uh, there is no destination for which privacy, for which there is privacy. Right? It just doesn't exist. As long as it's going through a central party, as long as they're collecting data, as long as they're one of their key business propositions, um, one of their key value uh, capture methods is people's data, then it's not going to change. But it doesn't necessarily, uh, this sort of like grasping of individual privacy is not going to be the thing that necessarily spurs people off of that, right? Uh, no. <laughs> no. I mean, it might be, but... Quite possibly not. I mean, we were talking on the way over here. Um, you see a lot of this stuff as kind of cyclical movements in technology, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the history of, of Microsoft once was sort of dominant in, in the industry in terms of, 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 of what? Its share in, in software and PC, PC. Yeah, OS, Word, you know, document management. Right. And so is it, is it, is it just that I'm taking a, or maybe we are taking a, uh, too narrow view of, of companies' consolidation and, and power, you know, because it seems hard for me to, to imagine a future in which we're not using WhatsApp to communicate or Instagram, uh, you know, or, or even Facebook. At the, the, the network effect seems so strong in some of these. Yeah. It's just very difficult for me to see that break up. Yeah, eventually, um, everything gets commoditized eventually, right? <laughs> sure. So it's like, uh, it starts with IBM, they create a computer, right? It's, it's all about the hardware back in the 70s, um, early 80s. And it, 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 they're untouchable, right? They've got, a, they've got a monopoly. But then eventually, Microsoft comes along and says, oh, actually, it's not about the hardware, it's about the software, it's about the operating system, it's about the, the document authoring, it's about the, the, the formats that people exchange data in, mm. yeah? And uh, of course, that's now the platform Hardware doesn't matter, right? Hardware has been commoditized. IBM has to compete with Compaq, has to compete with HP, has to compete with all of the other hardware manufacturers. Well, uh, fast forward to the late 90s, early noughties, suddenly actually operating system software has become commoditized. Right. It doesn't actually matter anymore. We're starting to see the rise of the smartphone. We're starting to see tablets coming out in the late noughties. We're starting to see uh, Macs take off again. Suddenly, the operating system doesn't matter. And it's all about um, file formats. It's all about which browser you're using. Yeah, fast forward to the, to the teenies. And the browser doesn't matter anymore. It's all <laughs> about what, what people are browsing. So it's no longer the operating system. It's not the document format. It's not the browser. It's like which websites people are going to. Oh, it's Facebook. It's Google. Google, it's eBay, it's about user accounts, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, where is it going to become in the, in the tween 20s? I don't know. Um, I suspect uh, we will do away with user accounts. I suspect mm. um, our devices will contain our user accounts. I would <laughs> hope they will eventually contain our data as well, attached to those user accounts, encrypted on the device, encrypted in the cloud with the key on the account on the, on the device, perhaps. Um, and that services will do just that. They'll provide the service, but not the data storage, not the data siloing. Mm. Um, but I don't know. We'll oh, see. That's really interesting. I, I, I have to ask you the question about you know, Facebook and Libra. 
uh, is having the resident blockchain expert here. Um, you know, Facebook very uh, loudly, you know, announced its decision to play in the arena. They announced this Libra, this cryptocurrency, uh, and they said, yo, we, we love the blockchain too, right? We want to be a part of this. We want to build crypto that's safe and that, that regulators can appreciate and, and we're okay. And, and uh, is that ring hollow to you? You know, is that, does that sound like what you're trying to do or is that, is it, it seems kind of self-defeating, right? Isn't the whole point of, of creating blockchain technologies to get away from the Facebooks and the aggregators like these? Yeah, I, 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 I think, you know, they're, they're taking a step in the right direction. Mm. Um, but if you look at the, uh, uh, you know, what's behind uh, Libra and what the regulators could possibly in the future agree to, mm. um, then it's, it's not going to look much like what we would, what we in the crypto scene would consider crypto. <laughs> um, it's realistically, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be kind of a federated PayPal. Right. It's going to be like, hey, let's get 20, 40, 100 uh, people from, uh, you know, industry um, um, uh, leaders, um, or at least industry corporates, sure. and uh, bring them together around a table, and they can each help run this thing. So it's going to be more decentralized, it's going to be less centralized, <laughs> all right? It's going to be less centralized, but it's not going to be decentralized. It's like right? blockchain light. Right, or just some, some it's like half, I mean, do you think that's a positive step towards, you know, getting folks at least more comfortable with the idea of decentralization? You know? um, I, think, I think it's valuable in so much as it, it helps prove the technology. It sure. helps prove a value proposition um, that uh, decentralization isn't just an idealistic thing. Yeah. It's, it's something that even, you know, the Facebooks uh, of the world want to do. Sure. Um, but that said, I, I think it's not going to, it's, it's not the final solution, yep. right? Uh, so, I, you know, we have a few minutes left, but I want to talk about uh, governments broadly, right? So think about this new world of, of people actually spurring adoption, creating their, their own sort of uh, blockchain projects, you know, maybe, or, or just deciding uh, how to, how to essentially deal with this new, this new way of, of, of of, cre of not consolidating all of our information in one place. It's sort of like breaking that apart. At the same time, like that, that's a positive step, but at the same time, how do you sort of wrangle with all the different opinions in there? How do you govern the, the direction in which this technology even goes, you know? Yeah. The point of it is to, is kind of not to, right? <laughs> it, 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 in, in some sense, yeah, it's um, the uh, decentralized, when you decentralize stuff, yeah. right? Um, you, you do have these, uh, you run into interesting new problems, mm. right? So in the old days, uh, well, the kind of the current days, <laughs> you've got the, you know, the Facebooks, right? You've got the CEOs, you've got the Mark Zuckerbergs. Um, if they want to alter the Facebook platform, then they make the decision, right? Because they control the platform because yep. there's a single service provider, right? They own the thing. Um, the users don't own it. The stake, the assembled stakeholders don't own it. Yeah, it's Space it's owned. Space way or just go away, right? <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, and when when you decentralize systems, then uh, you know the the stakeholding um, uh, uh, sort of um, um, group become much more diverse, much more widespread, um, and you. In, in theory, at least, do away with um, single-person leaders. Sure. Um, so how do you make those decisions on where to take the platform? Or does the platform just stagnate? And we're seeing in this space, in the sort of blockchain, crypto-y kind of space, platform stagnation, right? We're seeing a, an inability to take decisions mm. um, or a, an unwillingness to take decisions. And so governance is really the answer to that in, in some sense, or at least it's the, uh, the problem space. Um, how do we take decisions as a whole, given that we are decentralized and we can't come to a, uh, uh, we can't nominate a leader? And it's the same sort of things that states, nation states over the years, over the centuries have really had to solve as well. I don't know if that gives me confidence or, or <laughs> concern for the future. Real quickly, do you think, do you think that we're going to get there in terms of governance, in terms of coming together and pushing, pushing through to figuring it out? I don't doubt it. We've got uh, social scientists working around the world for many decades to uh, answer these questions for the, uh, you know, in terms of nation states. It's, we're just going to start seeing internet-based nation states. That's all. Thank you so much. Thanks, Gavin. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Mike. Yeah.